It's a terrific Thursday evening here in the city of Lagos. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Game On, coming to you live from the studios of uh, New Central Television. My name is Baba Kweki. Thank you for joining us. Remember, this uh, show comes to you from uh, channel 422 on DSTV. We're also streaming live on YouTube, which means you can follow us anywhere in the world that you are. We're also on social media, which means you can use the following handles, X, Instagram, and of course, uh, TikTok to also join the conversation as well. Welcome once again uh, to the show. I'm not doing the show alone tonight. Only what you want to quiz with me, only what you want to, of course, you know, is deputy editor of Sporting Life, one of Nigeria's finest uh, masters. Thank you so much for joining us, Onye. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Always a pleasure to be on the program today. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, of course, we have plenty lined up for you tonight. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Athletics is the main course that we're serving you with tonight. And the World Athletics Indoor Championships will begin tomorrow, starting from the 1st to the 3rd of March. Some of the finest athletes in the world will be on display. And Nigeria's fi some of Nigeria's finest track and field stars are set to compete at the tournament. World Athletics have also confirmed the participation of no fewer than 20 reigning world champions and seven Tokyo Olympic gold medalists with a total of 651 athletes from 133 nations vying for, go for glory. And this includes 18 gold medalists from the previous edition seeking to retain their titles. Yes, it's all set for the World Athletics Indoor Championships holding in the beautiful city of Glasgow, my second city, by the way, and I actually used to live right in front of that Emirates Arena, beautiful place uh, that you see uh, on your screen. Well, no fewer than six Nigerian athletes will be competing at this uh, World Indoor Championships holding in Glasgow at the Emirates Arena. They include Ese Brube, who is an Olympic uh, bronze medalist. Uh, she'll be competing in the women's long jump event. Joining her, uh, Chidi Okezie, Sikiru Adeyemi, Dubem Chuku. Uh, any relation of yours? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Endose Badin, who will team up for the men's 4x400-meter relay. Wanchuku will also compete in the individual 400-meter race, while Ibadin takes on the men's 800 meters. Chukwe Buka Enekwenchi, who recently set an African indoor record in the short put, will also be in the hunt for glory in Glasgow. Well, joining us now all the way from a chilly Glasgow is a good friend of mine and is also country, uh, country manager of Making of Champions, one of Nigeria's finest athletics promotion companies, Deji Ogenyibo, joins us uh, from Glasgow. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us, Deji. It's an absolute pleasure to see you again. Uh, thank you very much, Tunde. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Mm. Well, uh, it's six Nigerian athletes at the World Indoor Championships. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. We're talking about none other than Toby Amuson. Well, we had heard that she will not be competing at the World Indoors, instead preferring to compete at the African Games. Surprising? Your opinion? Well, not exactly. Um, Toby really runs the indoor season, and um, it was even more surprising to see her run early on uh, where she ran in Kazakhstan and broke the African record. Um, she also ran at the Milros Games, I think, and as she said, she had a bet with her coach, um, Lassana Clark, that if she runs 37.7 seconds, um, she's going to go for the World Indoor. So guess what? She only did two. So maybe that was the bet and did not come through. So uh, perhaps that's why she's missing the world indoors. But I mean, it's not a big deal. Most athletes um, usually skip it, especially in an Olympic year. Um, knowing full well, that's the ultimate goal for them. And Toby will certainly have her eyes fixed on that. Uh, for the African Games, well, she's always been one not to uh, skip African events. If it's one thing I must give Toby credit for, um, she always comes through for Nigeria uh, when it comes to even the African events. I mean, you've seen many global stars, especially from an African perspective, usually skip the African games, skip the African championships, 
and just focus mainly on the Diamond League where they get more money or the World Championship or the Olympics. But not Toby, the fact that she's even having to miss a World Championship event indoors to compete for the African Games speaks volume about her intent for wanting to compete for Nigeria too. So I wouldn't say I was very surprised about it. Um, I mean, the world, the former world record holder, Kenny Harrison, is not here. Um, there's no Jasmine Kamacho Queen, who is the Olympic champion, only Devon Charlton. Um, is the main um, course in the women's 60 meter orders, and the same Devon Charlton to be beat at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in this in the United Kingdom um, in 2022. So um, nothing to really fuss about. Um, so let's just take it with ease that Toby is not here, and perhaps she's preparing uh, better for the African Games leading up to the Olympic Games in Paris in July. Mm. Well, if Toby is not in Glasgow, as you confirmed to us, so where does where does Nigeria's medal hopes a lot. Where, where are medals likely to come from? Uh, there's Isebume, there, an Olympic bronze medalist in the long jump. Could she possibly medal? Well, I mean, she's always been our only hope before Toby Amoson also went up the scene. Um, last two years in Belgrade, Isebume won our only silver medal in the long jump. And this time around, it's kind of like a 50-50. I've still been in touch with the Federation all through today about um, whether she's going to be in Glasgow. And um, as her this morning, I mean, she um, only had to renew her passport and it got to her in Houston. But she has to get a visa in Nigeria, in Abuja, right? So the Federation are still trying um, earnestly to rise toward athletics to see if she can get a visa on arrival. She doesn't compete up until Saturday Sunday evening, uh, which is like the last session of the World Athletics event. So um, that's the major reason why potentially we might not see a Brume. So fingers crossed. The same reason stopped Ruth Usora from competing, as um, she doesn't have up to six months left on her passport page. So, um, um, and it's um, something that she cannot obviously fly with, as she's also based in uh, Houston, Texas. So, uh, these were our two medal ups as they were in the top five um, in the women's long jump. In fact, Ruth Usora is ahead of um, Essie Brume um, in the rankings, um, in the women's long jump. But, I mean, we always know Essie. Essie is a championship athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, last year was the first time she did not win a major championship um, medal uh, since um, you perhaps have to go to London 2017. So it just tells you how consistent SA is. So if we're going to win any medal, for certain, it has to be SA Brume. And hopefully she gets on that plane to Glasgow before Sunday. Mm. Well, uh, of course, we did mention that uh, Chukwe Buka Ene Quinchi is also in the mix for the men's shot put. He recently set a new African record in the uh, men's indoor shot put event, but he'll be coming up against bruisers, monsters, the likes of uh, Ryan Cruiser and Darlan Romani in the men's shot put. Could he possibly, possibly upset these two? Well, before I answer that, I just got a confirmation that SA will not be coming to Glasgow. Um, the World Athletics couldn't uh, get them through. So uh, that's one medal down the drain for Nigeria. Ooh. About Chukwe Buka and Ikwechi, um, I mean, I've been in touch with him the last one week. We still spoke this afternoon. Um, in terms of preparation um, of any athletes in Team Nigeria's camp, he is the most prepared, psychologically and physically. Um, he set a new um, African record. Um, um, in the um, um, shots put indoors, he's been locking on the 22 meters mark, right? And he's already in the top eight and he's straight into the final. It's going to be a very long shot. I can tell you that for free. I mean, there's no price for getting who will win the men's shot put. The world champion and the world record holder and mm -hmm. Olympic champion around Krauser is the incredible man mountain of a human and is the most likely to win that. That's Dalani Romani. Um, and a couple of others that are way above Chikwe Buka, but you can't put it behind him um, that he's capable of also sneaking in and getting on the medal if he gets his ass racks right. I mean, I saw him train this morning um, at the um, Emirates Arena, and I mean, he's feeling pretty much confidence compared to what happened in Budapest where the rain affected his throws and he couldn't make it to the final. So uh, let's see how it goes for Chikwe Buka. Uh, for the four, men's 4x4, four four, um, it's also a long shot. They competed in uh, Belgrade two years ago, and they couldn't make the final. Um, there's Sikiru, there's Dubem, who just flew in from Houston today. Um, saw him just this evening, and he's trying to warm up and get into gear. Uh, there's um, Edose Ibadin, who also set um, an indoor African record, um, um, I'm sorry, Nigerian record, lower in his Nigerian record earlier this year. 
Um, there is also Chidio Kezie as well as Sikiru Adewale also coming through. So it's a very lean team, and I, we shouldn't fret as Nigerians because, I mean, we've not got any world um, or indoor track in the country, so it's not a sport. It's literally um, a winter sport, right? Mm. Um, so um, I, just in terms of appearance, I think that's just key for us. But now that it's confirmed that SA won't be there, I only hope apps lies with Chukwebuka, and it's a very... A very, um, very slim percentage of possibility that he's going to get on the medal or on the podium. Mm. Well, your company, uh, your your company, your organization, uh, MOC, recently held uh, uh, a trials with the Athletics Federation of Nigeria track and field. Uh, it was a very successful one, by the way, uh, in Asaba. And some people are asking that why are some of the athletes that competed in Asaba that also are currently in the Team Nigeria camp, the 33 called up by AFN, why are some of them not in Glasgow as we speak? So, um, I could give a couple of reasons. Um, Finance-wise, the mm. priority is the African Games, right? Um, secondly, we don't... I mean, they competed outdoors. They didn't compete indoors. Mm. A large number of the countries that are competing here, especially the European countries and Americans, have all competed indoors this season. Mm. So, in terms of preparation, it's completely different. So, you, it's incomparable. So, nobody there, uh, maybe a side secret... Um, the I mean, who also competed um, in, um, in Asaba is coming through. But it's going to be a different feel, whether you like it or not. And that's just the reality of things. So I'm not really expectant of much. Um, the Ethiopians who won it um, in Belgrade um, and top the medals table, they have specialist um, runners that compete indoors. Well, not in their country, but all over the world. Uh, Gudafs again, um, um, Samuel Tefera, so and you go on that. and on, mm. right? So it's, it's a situation where... Um, our athletes that are competing here are the ones based in the United States. So, for example, Tobi Mwachiku has competed four times this year, but all in the United States, indoor track circuits, right? Same thing with um, Chukwe Buka, going around Europe, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, breaking his own African record, um, and as well as the, um, his uh, national record too. So, um, it's a situation where they already are in tune with the environment compared to the ones that competed outdoors in Asaba. Okay, so finally, uh, finally, DJ, I need to ask you, since... Uh... Nigeria has no hope of a medal from what you said so far. Now, so I didn't say no. Hey, well, hey, that's what you said. You said, our biggest hope. you said our biggest hope is a broom, but it's not there. So we might as well pack our, our cameras and our bags and just not, just forget about a medal. But I'm just joking. Anything can happen. But uh, what are the possible matchups to look forward to? I'm, I'm talking about matchups like uh, Noah Lyles versus Christian Coleman in the 60 meters. That's one to look forward to. Carson Wahom and Jerem Richards in the men's 400 meters. Another great matchup to look forward to, Selimon Barega and Josh Kerr, the men's 3,000 meters as well. And also there's a possibility of a thrilling matchup between Jamaica, the USA, and the Netherlands in the women's 4x400 four meters. So, in your opinion, which one are you looking forward to the most uh, at these indoor games? For me, well, it, it's, it's pretty close between the 60 meters, uh, between mm. all of them. But I would go for Tefere and, um, and uh, Josh Kerr. Josh Kerr is, is an own boy. He literally grew up straight away from Emirates Arena and um, left to him, he wouldn't compete in Scotland because of the Olympics and I always be praying for it. Some of his rivals and the one fight, mm. uh, Jakob Ingerbergs and Jake Whiteman, have all skipped the indoor season all because they're focusing on Paris. But this is important for him because it's his home tough. And, but for the Ethiopians, they've gone on a streak of 10 years winning the men's 3,000 meters. Mm. Um, Tefera has won it back to back to back from um, Portland in 2016 to Birmingham in 2018 and to Belgrade in 2022. And now you want to keep that streak running for the Ethiopian. So that matchup is pretty exciting, considering that Josh Kerr is more of a 1-5 runner, um, a 1,500 runner. And um, for Tefera, that's a specialist event. Too. So I, I feel that that build-up is uh, pretty good, and I would not want to miss that for anything. Um, well... Coleman and Laos, uh, the world record holder versus the uh, current fastest man um, or world lead indoors this season. So um, those are pretty good matchups um, you would want to see. Um, on, on, on a personal note for me, I, I wouldn't look beyond um, seeing uh, what I would expect in the men's uh, poll vote, even though um, there's a very high possibility it's going to be Mondo Duplantis again. Oh, but, again, um, yes. Uh, and it's OBN is also doing pretty well for himself, and he could also spring up a surprise. He, mm. he won silver and put the best outdoors, but who can challenge Paul, um, the, the Paul Food Maestro, uh, Mondo Duplantis? He's, mm. he's, such, he's such a... He's a showman, and that, that's what makes our sports really special. Yeah. And the fact that we get to see the super heroes compete, both indoors and outdoors, and appreciate what they can do.
mm, Mondo Duplantis. A lot of people say he is the heir to the legendary Sergi Bubka, but I don't know about that. I'm sure that you possibly agree. But thank you very much for joining us, DJ Ogengbo, athletics expert, MOC country director, for joining us today, all the way from Glasgow. I envy you very greatly, my friend, but uh, have a wonderful evening. I will be talking to you some more. I will be talking to you some more, DJ. Thank you so all much. Right, have a wonderful go. evening. Well, uh, oh yeah, uh, he said it all. There's no possibility of us uh, getting any medal at this indoor athletics championship. Yeah, the, it's a brumer factor. It's like a breaking news. Mm. Yeah, before we came here, came to the studio, we already knew that um, uh, Toby Lola Amosu mm. will not be going to the World Indoor yes. uh, Championship in Glasgow. And um, you know, you, 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 he literally broke it down that Toby uh, excused herself to concentrate on the preparations for the, the African, African Games. Games. You know, sometimes the some of these championships are so close to avoid injuries mm. and burnouts. She prefers to you know compete for Nigeria at the African Games, and I, I think it's. I think that's a plus for the African yeah, Games. Yeah, the it, world champion is saying, "I want to compete at the African Games instead of the Absolutely, Games. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and it shows the kind of uh, patriotism, the commitment she's, you know, she she gives to Nigeria and the African continent, mm. and we must commend her for that. You know, um, the championship from the championship, you make a lot of money. The, the Golden League uh, jackpot, you make mm. money. But when an athlete now decides to focus. With all the problems we have, you know, <laughs> that it means she's putting a uh, uh, yes, country first, a, a country first mm. and making a lot of sacrifice. Mm. But for Esebrima, I think um, she, Esebrima and Gloria Arlosi are the only two Nigerians that mm. have won uh, medals at both the indoor and, and outdoor, outdoor, outdoor well, championship. Yes. And we are thinking that um, um, Amosu, yeah, Amosu, Amosu will, will yeah, also we'll join. join her. But maybe, maybe next year. Or maybe some next other time. year. Maybe next year. But uh, I sincerely doubt it. From what uh, everything that Dejo Gengbo has said, it seems that she prefers to focus more uh, on uh, outdoor. Like outdoor events that particularly favor. Yeah. Well, let's move on from athletics, move on to football. Interesting story coming out of the Nigeria Professional Football League today. And uh, it's pretty much uh, something that happens quite regularly. We hear that the, the management of Heartland Football Club of Oweri have placed the players on half salaries following their poor performances over the last uh, few uh, weeks, uh, especially the following that 5-1 uh, thrashing at home at the hands of Player 2 United. And that led uh, the, uh, the, the management of Heartland to tell the players that now, on to further notice, you are all on half salaries. Uh, oh yeah, this is a question that I ask myself. These players have contracts. Did it stipulate in that contract that if you do not play well, we will play you, we'll pay you half salaries. Or this is just on a whim by the club management. Is this legal? It's not legal. This is ab absolutely laughable. Mm. You know, it, this is like a recording that might happen. Club managers uh, do it to save face. You know, um, it's like... Because they don't want to accept responsibility. Absolutely. Mm. You know, um, most of these clubs are owned by state government. And they know that uh, if, they don't, if they don't take such action to go and defend themselves when you know when they are called when they are summoned mm. by their principals they, they need to do something and you know it's, it's ridiculous like you said these, these players have contracts you have you have contracts that you the have players have, you have signed yes, yes. and um, you know for instance you sign two three years contracts if you have a reason to doubt the abilities of the players what there are do, clauses for termination yeah, right clauses, clauses for termination and you, you have to even pay off the players to so now single out the players um, you know, for for blame. Mm. The same club that hired the manager and fire and uh, relieved him of his responsibility within barely within weeks brought back another. But the manager who wasn't doing well in the first place, who are now rock bottom of the league, twentieth out of the twenty team league, are now having do I say the <laughs> the presence of mind the, to the, slash the players' the, salaries? The, it's yeah, laughable, really. The, the man that they have brought back, that's mm. Christian Obi, former Nigeria um, international. You know, the, has not won any match. Mm. They, they, they hired uh, Kennedy Boboye, who went to a battle and got a draw. Mm. You know, and everybody was saying, okay, they could uh, turn around the, the fortunes of the team. But what has happened is purely uh, an administrative problem. <sighs> and the administrators are just trying to save face, save face by, pushing, by the, the pushing the blame to the players. Really, really sad. I, really? I read, I read, I read a, st a, a story where the chairman, I mean the GM, uh, was um, credited uh, saying that uh, he was rooted to the sport after the game. 
No, I don't. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> Have you got plastered at home by five goals to one? I, I would be rooted as well. But let's uh, give you results from matches that were played today in the Nigeria Professional Football League. Uh, some really, really good games. Shooting Stars Football Club of uh, Ibadan. Well, they were at home. Uh, they defeated Bendel Insurance by a lone goal. This game used to be a classic in Nigerian football. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they lived up to all the hype. It was pretty much goalless up until very late in the game. Shooting Stars scoring the winner late in that game. Abia Warriors recall that uh, the. Uh, the manager of Abia Warriors is also on suspension as well. Uh, he, uh, they defeated Kwari United by a lone goal, while Ayimba thrashed Gombe United by four goals to nothing. Let's quickly show you the top half of the table, the top six of the table as it currently stands. Uh, Lobby Stars were still leading the log uh, as of yesterday, but these results, does it have an effect on the top of the log? Yes, it does, because Ayimba are now top of that log, followed by Lobby Stars, while Plato United, courtesy of their five one away win, are in third place, while Enugu Rangers are in fourth place. The bottom of the log still sees Heartland away. Firmly rooted to the bottom, followed by Gombe United. Those they were on the receiving end of a 4 0 plastering by Imba today. And just above them is Aqua United, former champions. They've had a terrible season so far. And Naja Tornadoes are also above them as well. Let's, let's leave domestic football now behind and move to international football. Uh, yesterday, we did tell you that uh, Super Eagles manager Joseph Acero uh, had said, uh, well, it was two days ago, uh, he said that he had a lot of offers coming from far and wide, at least five, six, seven offers from national teams and also football clubs as well. Well, it seems that one of those uh, countries that he was possibly eyeing, they've made up their mind, they've hired a new coach. I'm uh, talking about the Algerian national team. Team. They have replaced uh, Jamel Bermadi with Vladimir Petkovic, former manager of the Swiss national team. He is the new coach of the uh, uh, the Fenex, former Africa, two-time African champions, uh, Algerian national team, and he has been appointed, putting paid to uh, Joseph Pesero's ambitions of uh, possibly joining the Algerian national team. So it's possible that he could have been using Algeria, name dropping Algeria, in order to reach a proper bargaining position with Nigeria. Well, joining us all the way from Algiers is a good friend of mine, a North African football specialist. Uh, he travels far and wide and covers African football from north of Africa like nobody else. Mahem Ezahi, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Algiers this evening. Hey, Baba Tunde, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Trust me, my friend, the pleasure is mine. So uh, let's start. Vladimir Petkovic, what do you think of him? Is he a good manager, proper fit, the kind of man to take over from Jamil Bermadi? Are you excited? Uh, excited is a, is a very ambitious word. I wouldn't say that I'm excited. We're very much in the wait and see mode. I think many Algerians are. Uh, Vladimir Pekovic, as you mentioned, coached Switzerland for many, many years, qualified them to World Cups, to the European Championships. He also coached Lazio, uh, and he had some uh, good time coaching in Swiss, uh, Switzerland with Swiss clubs like uh, Young Boys Bern. However, uh, his most recent experience was with Girondin de Bordeaux in France. Um, and with them, he was, I would say, halfway responsible for getting that club relegated. Now, there were very there were many administrative problems at the club, uh, but still he achieved very poor results in the first half of his stint with them. So at the moment, we have a coach that has a pretty big CV, but at the same time has no experience coaching on the African continent. So many of us are just sort of sitting back and we're going to see what he does in his first, first few matches in charge. Well, um, looking at uh, the, the Desert Foxes at the Last Nations Cup, will you sincerely believe you know, their performances were you know, the coaching problem. You know, because a lot of us feel that um, the likes of Riyad Mahrez, uh, some of the players are, you know, in the twilight of their career. And really, maybe the coach did not, um, was not able to, you know, um, visualize that these players may not be in, the, in their right element to give their best. You know, sort of injecting players, you know, a gradual transition uh, into the team. Do you think that is actually the problem of coaching that led to the well, look, outing. At the last yeah, it, it's school. a very good question. Um, the players didn't play it up to the standard. I think that everybody can recognize that. But then isn't that also the fault of the coach for selecting those players? That was the hmm. main criticism in Algeria. It's why did he select those players? Why did he stick with Riyad Mahrez for so long, even though he hasn't been performing with the national team for over a year, with many Algerians going so far as to accuse uh, Jamal Bamadi of being too close to some of these players like Riyad Mahrez. He sees them more as his friends than as his players. You know, when he came to the job initially in 2018, 2019, he didn't hesitate to sanction Riyad Mahrez, for example, when he was late to a training session 
forcing him to sit out for that training session. But uh, the previous AFCON in Cameroon, he let Riyad Mahrez not even join the team for the, the training camp prior to the tournament. He let him come in late. And then despite the success of negative performances of his captain, he still continued with him in a starting role. So I think that was probably one of the main criticisms of the previous coaches that his, it's not so much his tactics that were the problem. It's that he stuck with the same old players and that we needed a, a regeneration of blood. Mm. Well, uh, Maha, I, I have to ask this question because it's one that I, I was, I've pondered for quite a while and it's one I've also asked you as well, that um, even the Algerian FA must be complicit in the, do I say, the fortunes, declining fortunes of the FedEx because some have argued that their penchant for lusting and chasing after Algerian, Algerians who are born in Europe instead of focusing on those born uh, in the country has led to a sort of uh, dichotomy where they're almost two separate camps uh, in the Algerian national team, those who are born in Europe and those who are proper Algerian born. And that has caused disharmony. How do you think they can end this? And how do you think uh, Petkovic can manage this? To be fair, I think this was a, a, a very big problem maybe 15 to 20 years ago. I think in the last decade, there's been much more harmony uh, in terms of the, we call them the local pros, the, the local players versus the pro players, mm. as if locals are not professional themselves. Yeah. Um, but I do Trust think me, this has been a Nigeria little bit less well. of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do think this is a little bit less of a problem as the Algerian clubs have sort of grown in stature and can pay uh, decent salaries. Um, we had, you know, two players, for example, at the African Cup of Nations who who play for Algerian clubs who were in the starting lineup. Uh, one of the, I thought the best player at the African Cup of Nations, Yusuf Belayli, the left winger, currently plays for MC of Algiers, the, the league leaders in Algeria. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, the federation, the main problem for them has been a lack of stability. We've had if I'm not mistaken, six federation presidents since 2017. That's not a recipe for a success. Uh, every time that the national team gets the slightest of, you know, failures or hits the slightest of speed bumps, uh, either the, the politicians or, or the government step in and remove the federation president or the federation president quits. And, and sometimes even there were problems between the federation president and the coach. So as I mentioned, that's not a recipe for success. So we kind of hope that this new, new federation president was actually only going to be here for two more years because he came in through the middle of the mandate of the previous one who quit. Um, we, we kind of hope that he can perhaps be a long-term option. Mm. Well, Maha, I have to ask this final question right now. So what is Petkovic's, uh, do I say, his long, short, medium, and long-term plan if he wants to get the Phoenix back to the top of Africa? What should he be doing now? Yeah, I'll just very quickly touch on the fact that Jose Pissero, I can confirm, was an option for the Fenix. They did actually offer him, uh, uh, they did put forth an offer. However, he was not the first option for the Fenix. Oh, Carlos wow. so, Quiros you, so you was can the actually confirm the that the, the, uh, uh, the Algerian Federation actually did approach Jose Pissero. Yes, absolutely. According to more than three or four sources of mine, uh, the Algerian FA did approach uh, uh, Jose Pissero and they did speak to him. However, he was not the first option. The first option was Carlos Quiros, the other Portuguese uh, Mozambican-born uh, coach uh, who previously coached countries like Iran, South Africa, Qatar, um, and Egypt. Mm. The second option was Petkovic. And they, they came to, they fi I finally came to an agreement with Petkovic. He's going to be on a big salary, 135,000 euros per month. Uh, but still less than the previous coach, Jamal Bomadi, who was on 208,000 euros per month. Um, but yeah, let's talk about Petkovic. So he's known as sort of an attacking uh, coach. The main negative criticism against him is that he also concedes goals. So uh, it's going to be one of those bouncing acts where he's going to have to find the right amount of attack without conceding too many goals. Um, his objectives are going to be a semi-final uh, berth at the come, upcoming African Cup of Nations uh, in Morocco and then uh, qualification to the World Cup, as well as getting to the second round of the World Cup. If he fails to meet either of those objectives, he can be fired uh, without any penalty. Mm. But, but with uh, him joining right smack in the middle of the World Cup qualifiers, don't you think this is dangerous? Yeah, I mean, the there is a World risk Cup qualifying, if we're being... Yeah, there is a risk. But if we're being completely honest with ourselves, this new format of World Cup qualifying, where we have nine and a half African teams going to the next World Cup, is a lot easier than, you know, the those wars that we used to have oh, in yeah. the past. You know, As you know very well, Nigeria oh, versus absolutely. Ghana, those playoffs. We, know, we, yeah, we, yeah. We remember. So, yeesh, those were very, very difficult. So I think these are a little bit easier, and he's off to a good start. The, the previous coach, Jamal Bamadi, leaves him with six points from the first two matches. Uh, we don't have a killer in our group. That The next toughest opponent, according to the FIFA rankings, is Guinea. Um, who Algeria is supposed to be favorites over, but that's the team we play next in June. So that's going to be one of his biggest tests. If he can get three points from there, we'll be well on our way to the Americas in 2026.
Okay, Mohamed Zahi, my good friend, all the way from Algiers. Thank you so much, my friend. It's always a pleasure to see you. And hopefully, you'll be keeping an eye on the uh, development in Algeria, and you'll be doing that for us as well. Thank you so much, my Shukran, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Speak soon. Bye. Yeah, so uh, your good friend, Joseph Pesero, one of his options is gone, which means we're still stuck with him. And from what we hear, uh, through the grapevine, we do hear that there are conversations currently going on with Pesero about keeping him in the job. I'm... I get the pressure you're not happy about that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, smiling, that's a good no, thing. No, no, no. But today, you know how these things are constructed. Mm. You know, um, some you know, agents or players, you know, get some people to write, write, something, write stories. Something. You know, that mm. um, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Once PSG, to buy these player, has to buy these players. In, you know, but, try but, to Mahe, try Mahe to did boost. confirm. He did confirm that. An approach was made. Yeah, but he's, he also admitted that in the pecking order, he was not the first. Choice. He was not the first choice. Mm -hmm. He was not the second choice. He was the third choice. So what it meant was that after Carlos Quiroz, you know, um, with Petkovic, with then Petkovic, him. then him. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no way the first two would, you know, be, um, I mean, they reject the offer. So he was not really in, in the reckoning. That's technically, mm -hmm. technically speaking, and uh, <laughs> financially, you know, and financially speaking. And um, if the uh, Nigerian Football Federation are speaking to him, I think they need to be fast about it. Mm -hmm. It, it, whether whether my um, reservation um, is, um, is worthy or not, it's not an issue. Mm. You know, this is my opinion. Mm. But the federation needs to move fast. You know, we had these issues in the past. Yes. After major yes. tournaments, exactly. we dilly dally. The, 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 the minister will say no or yes, and the federation will say we want um, an indigenous coach. At the end of the day, we waste a lot of time. Mm. If you want Pesero to continue. Then let him know now. Let him know now. If not, let, let him us know now. Bring a replacement and in. Please let them tell him play, play attacking football. <laughs> play attacking he football. gets results, and that's what really matters. That's, 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 so matter. uh, that's what really matters. What, what result are you talking about? I mean, we, we, have, this, we have won silver. He got you to the final we, of no, the no, we have won silver. The competition you did not believe we were going to get. It's not a big stage. deal today. We have won silver. But did you believe we were going to get that far? Honestly, on you. Uh, we have won silver did in the past. Did you believe we were going to get that? <laughs> well, let's quickly show you Joseph Pesero's call card in charge when he was in charge of the Super Eagles. There you see, he was appointed in May 15, 2022. He played 22 games, won 10, almost half of them, drew 5, lost 7, scored 39 goals, conceded 25, with a goal difference of uh, plus uh, 14. So a win percentage of uh, 45%. I mean, he scored plenty of goals. He won a few games as well. Only you can't get a coach that will win 20 games out of 20, 20 matches out he of He scored 20. plenty of goals today. He scored yes. 39 goals yes. out of 22 yes. matches. Yes. And, uh, some of these wins were mm. at the Nations Cup. Yes. And uh, you, can't, um, you can't isolate the determination, the enthusiasm of the players. Yes, his tactics worked to some extent, but when we got to the finals of the Nations Cup, we saw what happened. That was, mm. I think that was the poorest game that we played at that tournament. The first game and the, and the last game. I mean, the game against the Kutoria Guinea mm -hmm. and the, the final against the, the Elephants of Cote d'Ivoire mm. by the Poets. So why do you get to the final and you play uh, an entirely defensive game? It happens, game? it happens, oh yeah, it happens. It's not against the, the host nation, it happens. against oh, millions of Ivorians. All just nights, we lost the first game 5-1. We still lost 1-0 in the final game to the same team. It happens. But uh, that's how football is at times. You never really know how it plays out.